Ladies and gentlemen, uh, from Klamath Falls, uh, the Oregon Institute of Technology, uh, a technical expert in direct use uh, technology, uh, Miss Tony Boyd. My name is Tony. I used to work in the Geo Heat Center. I've actually been in Klamath Falls since I was. Oh, about yay big. Um, I actually, my dad uh, was in the service and uh, he retired uh, when I was seven years old and he moved up to Klamath Falls and I've been there ever since. I do get to leave every now and then, like Australia, been to New Zealand. Uh, this is my second time to Canada. The first time I only went to Victoria to visit a friend, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm actually enjoying myself. Um, so, uh, when I was growing up in school, geothermal really wasn't talked about. I really didn't know what geothermal was until I started going to college, and <laughs> I was 25. So, and I actually, like I says, I really didn't know about geothermal until I was 25, and I live in a geothermal community. So. Oh, we gotta go that side, left side. <laughs> so, um, Klamath Falls, pretty much we had some um, hot springs and back in the early 1900s, you know. Um, we also have our volcanic region in the Cas we have the Cascade Mountains. We have the, coast, uh, the coastal range and we have the Cascade Range. So we're in a pretty mountainous range. We're part of the Great Basin uh, down in Nevada and we're actually in the upper part of it. Uh, the Native Americans had been using that geothermal in the area for, for many, many years. They had the hot, as I mentioned, we had the hot springs. Uh, are the most famous springs that we had, one was called Big Springs. Notice I said was. Uh, Big Springs, which is actually where the present day uh, athletic field for one of our high schools. The other one was uh, uh, called Dev Devil's Tea Kettle. And it actually it was near one of our junior high schools. Um, neither one of these are around anymore due to uh, just the water levels have dropped so much that they're not noticeable anymore. Although, if you actually walked on Modoc Field, which is the athletic field at the high school, you can kind of see where it's kind of really green, kind of lush, and you kind of step, and it's like, and like I said, this is before I knew about geothermal, but it's kind of like, it was kind of squishy, you know, so it was kind of cool. This is actually just a kind of an overview, kind of a above ground of uh, Klamath Falls, actually the Klamath Basin area. You can see where Klamath Falls is. This is where the Klamath Falls area is. Altamont is, consi is actually what, um, and I didn't know it was Altamont. This is actually where the suburbs are. We're not actually in the town proper. We are in the urban growth boundary, but we're not in the real part of the city or as John says, I, I live on the wrong side of the tracks. Um, Klamath Hills, uh, this is where, and I'll get into this one, there is some geothermal in that area. Oling Gap is where they've been doing some exploration for geothermal power. Um, there's some geothermal in the Swan Lake Valley area. North of our campus, they really haven't found any hot water. It's pretty much our campus, and further and as you go further north, there is no geothermal that we can find. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is just another view of Klamath Falls. This is actually the town right here. This is Altamont area. This is the suburbs. This is Oling Gap, Klamath Hills. So you can see we actually have uh, quite a few areas where we have actually access to geothermal. Um, we actually have, we'll say, fairly good sized uh, four district heating systems. Um, I talked to um, John Lund, he used to be my, um, my boss at the, at the Geo Heat Center. And, you know, we used to say we only had two, but we actually have four areas where we actually have multiple buildings off of one well. We also have a couple of many residential district heating systems. Uh, we have two industrial sites just in the Klamath Basin. One of them is the Creamery. 
The other one, we actually have a laundromat. Uh, two greenhouse sites, one out at Klamath Hills, another one in the district heating system, one agriculture site. We have space heating. We have actually 600 different sites that use uh, geothermal for space heating. Uh, snow melting, we have four main sites. And the resorts and uh, spas, we actually have two swimming pools now that are heated geothermally. We used to have four, but two of them have been shut down due to they were getting old and they didn't think it was worthwhile to fix them up. One of them actually is on OIT campus. They decided to fill in the pool and make a basketball court. Uh, uh, Oregon Institute of Technology, they're really big into basketball. Our, uh, our men's team have actually been into the, um, into the playoffs quite a few years. Uh, Klamath Falls. One of the first developments they did was the White Pelican Hotel. This is actually a picture of it when it was, um, when it was built. Um, they actually had a swimming pool in the basement and they used it, they were using geothermal for the pool and the heating of it. It actually burnt down in 1926. And what they did, eventually they decided to replace it with the Balsinger Ford. So we had a Ford dealership that moved into the building, or moved in and, and built a building over it. Uh, Klamath Union High School is one of our, um, is probably our oldest high school right now at the present location. It's, it was built in 1930. Uh, Esplanade Street, Street Ramp and Bridge Believe it or not, 1948, they decided, they thought about putting in a snow melt system back then. Um, uh, OIT, its present location is, uh, was uh, put in 1964. It used to be located at, uh, at the end of Old Fort Road. It used to be, uh, it used to be a military facility where uh, veteran, vets coming back from World War II would come and re uh, Thank you, rehabilitate from uh, malaria. So they would come and because of our altitude and stuff, and then they made it into a tech school, a vocational school for the, for the veterans that came back. And eventually they made it into a two-year school, four-year school, and then because it was oil fire, they were paying out a tremendous amount of money, and they knew about the geothermal, so they actually moved it to its present, lo present location. Our uh, Sky Lakes, we actually have our hospital, actually put in a geothermal system in 77. And the Klamath Falls District Heating System was initially done in 1983. And there's a few other ones that have come around there too. Uh, Big Springs, this, as I mentioned, it was in Modoc Field. Um, it's, it's our athletic field for the high school. It was used by the natives. Uh, Europeans have used it. Uh, they used it to cook the cook meat and the vegetables. They've done bathing and swimming. Uh, they also had an ice skating rink and they used the geothermal to heat the benches, so. Um, they had a bathhouse there, which they called uh, Butler's Nat Natatorium. And at the time when they had the hot springs is when they ran the pipeline over to the White Pelican. And these are actually some of the old pictures of, of the big springs back then. The lower picture is actually a picture of a uh, the natatorium. Uh, Devil's Tea Card is, they, we really don't know for sure exactly where it was. Uh, we, we know it was actually located near the Ponderosa Junior High School. Um, the transients, we actually, Ponderosa Junior High is actually located pretty close to our railroad tracks. So we had a lot of transients back then, you know, riding the railroads. So they would actually sleep on boards above the springs, sometimes they get a little restless, so they rolled over and got, got kind of scalded. Uh, we actually have, uh, our community, we have a lot of, um, we have Upper Klamath Lake, and a lot of that is used for irrigation. We have a lot of farmland in our area, so we have the irrigation waters that actually will take it out to um, a lot of the farmers. So they actually constructed a, a canal to get that water out to the farmers, and uh, while they were digging around the Ponderosa School, they did encounter some springs, but you know, the, so they've actually, some of the springs are on one side of the canal and the other ones, they, they haven't been able to find them. 
Uh, Roosevelt Elementary School. This is actually one of our schools that actually is heated geothermally. Um, it was built in 1928. It's actually, our, like I said, it's our elementary uh, K through six. Uh, 362 students in the school. No, built in 1928. They actually didn't put geothermal in until 1960. And this is a geothermal area. And they, they finally got around to put in a geothermal. But if you think about it, 28 to 60, about 40 years, 30, 40 years, the useful life of the, of the boiler. So instead of putting in a new oil boiler, they put in the geothermal. Um, the depth of this well was only 152 meters. Uh, they actually have 95 degrees centigrade water. We do have really hot water in our area. Uh, they use a downhole heat exchanger to pull that water up. We're not pumping the water out. All we're doing is running a black iron pipe down the well. It's a closed loop system, and all we're doing is extracting the heat. Uh, that bottom part, a lot, of the, a lot of our wells back then, um, there's problems with the air water interface. So in the winter time, the water level will rise because we're extracting a lot of heat. But in the summertime, it starts to drop. So that air-water interface will actually corrode the pipes. So the way to com combat that back in the day when it was, it wasn't, they actually put waste oil down in the wells to kind of keep it lubricated, to kind of help it. Um, we've done some studies at, uh, at the Geo Heat Center, and what, we've, uh, what helps is the well, you have the pipes in there, but if you cover it, if you seal off that, that air entering into the well, that'll actually preserve the pipes so you won't have a lot of corrosion. Another thing we've experimented with is doing uh, putting a PEX tubing down inside the well. And that way you don't have to worry about the corrosion of pipes. Ponderosa, this is the one of the junior highs that actually is heated geothermally. It was built in 69, and it's only seventh and eighth grade. Um, 400, uh, 446 students. Now, and I should have had a different map. In Klamath Falls, we have a real, real hot zone. And one of our wells is actually 30 meters. And it's actually 30 meters, and it's actually pure steam and it heats two homes. This is our real, real hot area. This school is located really close to that area, um, and we have a lot of faults in our area, so we get a lot of spreading. This parking lot in front of this school actually has been spreading because uh, the, of the faults. We've actually had some spreading in that, and we've had some geologists come out and look at it and do a lot of evaluation on it. Um, this is the back side of the school, and if you go across the field, somewhere in there is where that, uh, that one hot springs is. Um, they actually have two wells. Uh, as, you, as, I see, as you can see, they're not really deep. We do have very high temperature. Um, for this size of school, they actually have a downhole heat exchanger. This is one of the largest downhole heat exchangers in Klamath Falls. It's a 1.2 megawatt thermal uh, heat exchanger. And it heats the whole entire building. Uh, KU, this, as I mentioned, that picture that I showed you, the natatorium, this is the present day swimming pool now. Um, it was originally built in 1928, which would be the front building. They've added on to it in 38 and in 58. The bottom picture is one of the extensions that they've added on to it. It is actually going through another uh, uh, facelift. Uh, they don't want to move the they don't want to move the school. They want to keep it because of the historical value of it. So they've actually been going in and uh, bringing it up to code. Uh, we actually had an earthquake in 93, and we've had several, several of our buildings that actually uh, got destroyed. Um, and since this is a brick building, it's really not up to code. It needs to be more reinforced. 
Uh, the wells that, that they used were actually drilled, uh, drilled in the Big Springs area down, down in the lower field. Um, they drilled them in 1964, the, the present ones that they have. Now, their production well is only 78 meters deep. They get about um, 89 degrees C. Uh, their injection well is pretty shallow too. Now, it's 76 meters from the production well, not very far away. So what happens, and the system still works, what happens in the winter, the temperature of the water will actually decrease because we are injecting that water so close to the production well. But because we have so much mass flow down there, um, it will recover. So in the winter time, it'll be up to where it needs to be. And they actually, we actually have line shaft pumps. Ellen Redkey Pool, uh, and I was, while well, I was doing all the research for this and I didn't realize this, um, I actually, when I, I actually swam in the swimming pool when I was a kid. Uh, okay, it was warm water. I didn't realize it was geothermally heated, but it felt pretty nice. And so the pool was built in 53, they started operation in 54. They have a downhole heat exchanger, like it says, they only pump the water down and up through a closed loop so they're not taking the water out. Uh, they try and keep the temperature, oh, that's supposed to be C, guys. <laughs> okay, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, a lot of my, a lot of my, yeah, a lot of my slides are in U.S. units, and I and I was converting over, and I missed that one. Sorry. Um, and it, the the downhole heat exchanger it heats the pools, the buildings, and the shower facilities. Now, they advertised on their on their website that this is the only Pacific Northwest pool that is open year-round outdoor swimming pool. You notice the top picture? They actually had a swim meet in the wintertime. You can see the steam, look at everybody in their coats. <laughs> so uh, yes, they do actually use it year-round. They have a lot of, um, a lot of schools that actually do races and stuff. Um, they actually put in a new slide. They never had that slide when I was there. Uh, Sky Lakes. This is um, our hospital. Not really sure exactly when it was moved there. We've actually had like four different locations for our hospitals. The one before this was actually heated geothermally also. So they have one production well, which is located close to our campus. We have OIT here. We have a road going up. The hospital is right here. So their production well is located close to our geothermal wells. They have 91 degrees seawater. Uh, they have one injection well that is just down the road, real close. They actually heat this main building. They've gotten a facelift. This whole entire building right here. In front of that, they have uh, a doctor's office. And then on the, on the other side, they have a big, huge complex which handles uh, the orthopedics office and vascular. So they actually have a great big, huge complex. Uh, plus, they do snow melting. Right there where the entry is, this all right here is all snow melted. All this part is all snow melted. Safety issue. Klamath Falls, this is our district heating system. This is just kind of an overview. Uh, to give you an idea, OIT is up that way, up north. Uh, oh, I live way over here. <laughs> this is actually the production line. We have a geothermal well here and a geothermal well here. We bring it in to this building right here. That is actually behind our uh, Plymouth Museum. And the injection well is right here. And then they have a closed loop system. After we transfer the heat from the geothermal water using a plate, fr plate and frame heat exchanger, then we have a closed loop system that circulates to all these other buildings. So you go, this is on a unit by itself, this is Esplanade, this is actually a snow melt system. Anything that is blue is a snow melt system. So it goes all the way out here, greenhouse, 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 and then it goes back. Uh, the city has looked at into the possibility of closing the loop, 
but they haven't, economically wise, they haven't done it yet. And one reason is, look at Conoff Falls. See all the little brown spots? Those are our buildings that are, that are connected onto the um, district heating system. You see a lot of white spots there. Unfortunately, we have cheap gas, so it's really hard to try and get people to convert over to the geothermal, even though that system's been around for a long time. So uh, if we could get more buildings on it, then they can complete the loop. What what's, what's, would be their biggest problem is if there is a break in the line here, if they ever have a break, they have to shut down the whole entire system because they have no way to bypass it. So everybody on this side won't get any geothermal. Um, when you connect to the city district heating system, they require you to have a backup just for any kind of instance where we get a line break. So what does it cost for the heating? The heating? Um, depends. Um, the museum, since the museum is letting them use the well that they had to re-inject, they get free heat. Uh, most of the buildings, most of the people on the system actually pay 80% the cost of natural gas. So to them, that's a big savings. Um, the greenhouse, which actually is one of the bigger users, they knew what they were getting. They says, well, I think we should get a better deal. We, you know, we're, we're one of your bigger customers. And uh, so I think they got down to 72%. <laughs> and what, what's important to understand is even though you're paying 80% the cost of natural gas, you are actually paying less because if you have a gas furnace, it's only 95% efficient. So 5% of that cost is actually going up the flume, right? So you're actually saving, 70, it's only 77% the cost you would pay for natural gas. Um, Klamath Falls has, has two production wells, uh, 112 meters and 274 meters. One's 108 degrees C and the other one's 102 degrees C. They do have to, when they're pumping the water up, they do have to make sure that it stays under pressure because when, if they keep it under pressure, it stays water. If they lose a little bit of pressure, it'll flash to steam and that two-phase water isn't always very good for their system, so they try and keep it pressurized. Uh, they can actually, for the total system on the geothermal side, can actually pump 82 liters per second. The one injection well they have is 360 meters deep. It's actually artesian. It will actually flow artesian if it's not capped. Um, it will handle only three, uh, 663 liters per second. So they are kind of capped, sort of kind of capped on their system. They just have to look at for another place to do an injection well. And there's plenty of places around there um, where there actually is some wells that they could re-inject into. Uh, the design of the system, this is the closed loop side, are clean water that is circulated through the community. Is, uh, the supply temperature was designed for 99 degrees C. They don't always get that to the community. Uh, utilizes a 22 de degree C, a delta T that they take out. Everybody on that system gets that supply temperature or one degree less because by the time it gets to the greenhouse, it actually might have lost some heat. But everybody gets that temperature and they are expected to take out the 20 degree C. If you take out more, they don't care. If you take out 10 degrees, yeah, they kind of get a little mad because they say they, it's more efficient to them if they can drop that temperature down even more before it goes through the heat exchanger and, we, and they heat it back up. What are the pipes made of? Hmm? What are the pipes made of? Uh, they use steel. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, they use ductile iron. So they use ductile iron with a, with a foam insulation and then a, um, a jacket on top of that. So they don't corrode? So it don't corrode, yes. Um, our soil that we have, and once we get the, the groundwater infiltration into it and it starts hitting those pipes, 
it will actually corrode. Um, the, the pipes that we had on campus, we were actually directly buried. Um, and pretty much 20 years after the pipes had been in there, and due to the way the, on campus, it was field insulated, so they kind of put like a little tar thing on them, and with the pipes, you run the geothermal to it, and it expands. So when you shut it off in the summertime, it contracts. So that insulation that we had actually cracked enough for the groundwater to infiltrate. We had more corrosion on the outside of our piping than we did on the inside. So uh, eventually, back in the 80s, yeah, late 80s, they actually had to replace almost every single pipe on our campus. But we put it in tunnels, so we're protected now. Um, and, and we actually are, once on campus, we actually went to fiberglass, reinforced fiberglass plastic. And the type of pipe you can use is determined by your temperature also, temperature and your pressure. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a hot springs I know, Eastern Oregon, they use PVC piping. They have high temperature, but the cost of the PVC, uh, if they have to replace it in 10 years, it's not very far. That's what they use. Uh, this is actually pictures of, this is them putting in the first production well. Uh, we did an extension to, it's called the Ross Racklin extension, it's to our theater. This is them putting the extension. This was my first geothermal job. I actually got to be an inspector on that job. Uh, and down below is actually the heat exchange room. This is where they transfer the geothermal heat to the closed loop system. Oh, as you can see, they actually have two different heat exchangers. What they do is they use one heat exchanger and then they actually have one that they ship out. They ship after they use it for a couple of years, then it gets shipped out, they be cleaned. You have to, they clean the plates and then they have the other one as backup. So they actually have three different plate sets. Redundancy is always nice. Um, they have two pumps. This is an older picture. John isn't as gray as he is now. Uh, they actually have three pumps now. And, like, and it's just for redundancy to make sure that they can keep everything running. Um, the system at one time would actually be shut on nine months out of the year. Then we shut down the rest of the time. Um, not always good for the system. They want to try and keep it running year round, but they have to shut it down for about two weeks for maintenance now. But they want to try and keep it year round from now on. Uh, at least the water department does. The city, eh. um, They have 21 customers. Uh, three of them are city government buildings. We have five county buildings one federal government building, our theater, four churches, and seven different businesses. Yeah, I knew it was there somewhere. Um, when this uh, was initially set up, when it was initially conceived, phase one was to connect 10 government buildings, which they did. And then they were gonna connect up more and then more so they were actually envisioning this whole district, uh, district heating system to cover the whole downtown area. Didn't happen, but you know, they tried. Uh, they had some difficulties when they originally put it in. Um, and it's nothing with design or anything. It's just that the, the piping that they put in, the couplings failed. So it was shut down for a while. Another problem was I mentioned downhole heat exchangers. Um, with us having 600 geothermal wells in town, and some of those wells, a lot of the t wells only have downhole heat exchangers where they only take the heat out. Well, to make those downhole heat exchangers work, the wells are designed a certain way. So they drill them, and then they put the casing in, but the casing is perforated just below the water line and at the bottom where the flow is. So what happens when you, uh, what happens is when you drill a well, you have a profile. It's colder at top, gets hotter as you go down. So to make, these, to, to make the wells work better, 
when you perforate them, you have a convection, center, a convection cell going on. So the temperature that is down at the bottom actually gets lifted up to the top. So when you do a profile of it, you hit the water, and then when you hit those perforations, the profile goes like this. So you, you're, that heat exchanger is being, the, is being heated up the whole entire well, uh, length of that well. So instead of using, think about if, <clears throat> if you're putting water in, and you know, it's only, say you dropped it down to, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna switch to US units, uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's going down into a well at 180 degrees. Well, okay, it's gonna start picking up heat, and then when it comes around on the loop, well, if it's 100 degrees up here, you're gonna start losing heat, right? So with the profile straight up and down, you're gonna pick up a lot of heat. Better transfer. So the community, the ones that had all these geothermal wells, they go, whoa, 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 well, you're gonna start pumping all this water, what's gonna to happen to all our heating? So we actually had to do a lot of studies. There was, um, they did several pump tests on uh, the wells in the, um, where we're gonna be re-injecting and pumping it out. Cause we had to, we had to prove to these community people um, that we were not gonna affect their wells. So there was a lot of studies done. There was tracer, uh, tracers tests done. And that's where you're pumping, uh, you're injecting water into a well and it has um, a dye. So to try and figure out where that water is going. And then when you pump it out, you can see where, what, what uh, tracers have actually come up. So you can see how much communication you have between the wells. Um, so eventually with all the, you know, after fi doing the, t the studies and stuff like that, they finally got it going in 1991. Uh, Due to not having a lot of people on it, and you know, we had trouble getting people to connect to it, they actually worked on a marketing effort from, uh, in 1992 to attract more customers. And some of the stuff that they did is, uh, some of the incentives was, um, first two years, all right, you can connect, we'll give you two years free. So they actually got free energy for two years. Um, and that's some of the things that they did. They, uh, some of the other incentives was they connect you for free. They put in the pipeline to your building. Um, so as you can see from 93 to 97, they actually added nine new customers, which makes it nice. Uh, IFA, that is actually our uh, greenhouse, was added in 2002. They moved here for the geothermal and the altitude that we have. We're at 4,200 feet, so we're pretty high altitude. A lot of their tree seedlings go to higher altitude uh, places. So we want, they wanted to make sure that they were hardened to it. Uh, Klamath Basin Brewery uh, was actually added in nine, uh, 2005. They wanted geothermal. They actually located in the creamery. They wanted to be on the geothermal system. Timber Mill Shores was going to be a huge development. Supposed to have nice houses and stuff, and yeah, you know, market went down. <laughs> the housing market went down, so got a bunch of empty lots with some nice roads, some snow melting on the sidewalks, but that's as far as it's gotten right now. If Timber Mills actually connects to the system, <coughs> the district heating system would be at max. Uh, these are just some of our buildings. The admissions buildings, that's the city. That's where you pay your water bill. Public works, that's where the engineering and planning is. Our treatment plant, uh, the actually our uh, wastewater sewer treatment plant is actually connected. The city police was on the district heating system, but they actually moved so they're no longer on the, on the system. Uh, the government buildings. <coughs> um, this is actually a picture of the old courthouse. Back in 93, we had that, um, just a little shaker, 6.0. But our, the downtown area is actually um, on lake bed. So what happened when we had the earthquake, the ground liquefied. So it shook the, it actually shook courthouse so it was damaged enough that we couldn't actually use it anymore. A building right next to it actually um, 
actually had to be torn down also. This is an older picture of the courthouse because right next to the courthouse was a, a vet's building for the veterans to go to um, get government help. Also, the county jail, oh sorry, the city jail was also there. So, um, so that actually got, had to be torn down. This is actually our new county building, our new courthouse. Um, the annex didn't have as much damage, but it got a, a pretty big facelift. As you can tell, green. Um, this is this and the rest of it. Um, Klamath Falls, I think our tallest building is four stories. <laughs> What about the pipes? Were any of those damaged in the earthquake? Uh, no. No, they, they, they didn't see any damage at all in the pipelines. Uh, the library is actually right next door to the courthouse. Um, the museum, that's like I mentioned, that's where the end of the production line. Post office. It's a pretty big building, but <coughs> Due to circumstances, our post office has been very, very downsized. Our mail actually gets mailed out of Eugene, gets stamped out of Eugene. They don't sort it here. Um, there is other businesses in there, but it, it's not as big as load as it used to be. Our Ross Ragland Theater is actually heated geothermally. We got some government money to put the pipeline out to them. Uh, Dwight Pelican. That's what it looks like now. That's the Balsinger building. Oh. Creamery. <laughs> um, st you, uh, part of this building is heated geothermally. There was a section of it that they weren't heating it. And we got a lot of snow one year. And it collapsed. You saw that big, huge open lot? That used to be part of the building. It's gone. Um, Gospel Mission, one of the churches we have on the system, this is over by the Ross Raglan. They connected up when we did the Ross, Ra Ross Raglan extension. We actually have a bank. Um, this is that tall building. <laughs> um, and this is actually looking down Main Street. Now notice our little crosswalks. They're actually and it's like really cool because I saw the bricks on your crosswalks. It was like, oh, it's almost like home. Um, those crosswalks are actually heated geothermally. Uh, Timber Mill Shores, this is the development I told you about. They actually worked on phase one. This is like, these are all snow melted sidewalks and they were gonna do phase two. Treatment plant, greenhouses are over here. Oh yeah. OIT is up this way. This is what we call the hillside area, hot springs. That's where a lot of our geothermal wells are. The Climate Falls snowmelt system. This part of the snowmelt system is on the return side. Before it goes back to the museum to get reheated, they used uh, heat, more waste heat. So we don't have to pump any more water, we just take a little bit more heat out. And we're kind of, Klamath Falls has been kind of, well, we used to be a lumber company, a uh, lumber town. We had quite a few lumber mills. I actually used to work in a sawmill. Um, so our industry has changed a lot. And the downtown has been kind of, kind of dying. Things have been moving out towards the county area, t down towards the suburbs. So they wanted, what they did is they decided to get some funding to do a downtown street, streetscape project. And what they did is they're trying to make it more beautiful, more presentable. They got nice little lights, street lights, and they decided to put in a snow melt system to make it more inviting to people. So. This is them putting in the sidewalks up there. This is one of our crosswalks. You can see they have the lo loops in, concrete, and put the bricks on top. Um, this is actually one of our bus stops. So the roads weren't really designed to have buses. We didn't get buses in Klamath Falls for eh, 10 years ago, oh, maybe 15 years ago. So the roads 
with the weight of the buses, we were actually having a lot of, um, a lot of damage because it, they couldn't handle the loads. So to help out with that and to make it easier, this is a transfer spot. The Ross Ragland is right across the road. So they made it so it's easier, the buses don't damage the road, and it's not slippery. And down below, this business owner decided not to connect. That's why there's snow. And they don't, they're not, they don't have to connect. Um, but, I mean, it really wasn't that, what, $2 a month to have a snow melt system in front of your house, in front of your building? Um, and you can see, we got some nice trees and stuff, and they actually put insulation uh, around the concrete so these trees aren't blooming in the wintertime. Uh, district heating system. Uh, they were doing, they got some grants and stuff, and they were kind of required to give tours of, of uh, their heating system, although they, they don't mind doing it. So this is actually from the National Geothermal Academy. Uh, when I had a bunch of students, we actually showed them the district heating system. Most of their stuff is controls. They have controls. Whoever is on call for the water and the geothermal system, they can actually pull up the SCADA system if they get some kind of alarm. So it kind of tells them where they can go, and it keeps track of, keeps tracks, makes sure that things are running properly. And that's one of the guys that's uh, in charge of the geothermal system. My favorite, uh, Klamath Basin Brewery. As I mentioned, the two gentlemen, they were they were linemen for uh, Pacific Power and Light. So and they brewed beer in their garage and they decided that they wanted to move out of the garage and open up a business. And they are actually from Klamath Falls. They probably, I think actually Del Brute was born and grew up in, in Klamath Falls. So they knew about the geothermal. Well, the Credit Lake Creamer used to, we used to, it used to be a milk processing plant. You know, ice cream and so it was empty. I mean, it's been empty for oh, probably about 12 years before they decided to move in here. And um, that's one reason why we still have the blue cow. So they decided to go in there and they, uh, they revamped the whole entire building. That's why I still call it the creamery sometimes because I still, um, so this is actually their fermenting takes. They actually bottle their beer now, which makes it very nice. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this. Our, geo, our drinking water actually comes from wells. We're all groundwater wells. Um, it's actually pretty good water. But our water is not really that cold, even our drinking water well. So, but we have, we have to be careful what we, you know, because we drill and stuff. Geothermal water, arsenic, hydrogen sulfide and stuff like that. Um, climate falls because we have to worry about our drinking water specs and stuff. So they're actually pretty limited on what they do. But with the geo, with our nice water and the geothermal, I took this off their website. See, all this helps makes their brews exceptional, pure in taste, and green in production. So, and I personally like it. You know, every time I talk about the brewery, you know, they actually give me a free beer. <laughs> I've, been, I've been stocking up. Uh, not only do they use the, the geothermal water for, for part of the brewing process, as part of the fermenting, they actually, they also use it for space heating in their building, and they also have snow melt around their walk area. So, this is, the heat exchanger. This is where the geothermal water comes in. I sh shouldn't say that. The heated district heating water comes in. They require every building, every customer, to have a heat exchanger just to separate city responsibility from business responsibility. Kind of like a, a valve on a, on a water meter. You have water coming in, city's responsibility stops at that meter. Everything past that is yours. I found that out. 
at a water leak. So this is just where they transfer the heat from, the, from that loop to their loop. Over on the back side of this, they actually have three different heat exchangers. One for the brewing and hot water, one for the space heating, and one for the snow melt. And this is just another picture of the, one of the tanks. Um, they changed their logo. As I mentioned, we're a lumber we used to be a lumber town. So they have the logging, and we also have the railroad. We have UP and um, Burlington Northern that come through us. They, this is, they actually have a depot here. Plus, we have Amtrak. Near airport, but we have Amtrak. <laughs> um, this is the front of the building. Uh, there's the blue cow, there's the grain silo. Now, one, two, they're expanding. They actually got that new grain silo this summer, and I got to watch it go, I got to watch it go up. This is inside. Um, you can't really see it, but from the, the building here, they own the rest of the, they own the, rest of the block. They're going to expand their, beer, their brewing process and hopefully their restaurant area. IFA Nurseries, that's the tree seedlings um, operation you saw in the video. Um, this is where their geothermal water, their heated water comes in. This is their heat exchanger for their operation and the pipeline that goes to the... But they, um, they actually get we'll just say orders to grow tree seedlings. They don't just grow whatever, they, whatever their customers want is what they grow. Their customers furnish them the seeds and they grow it. They actually, their whole entire operation, they can actually plant it in those little pone things. Um, but they mainly do Douglas fir, uh, hemlock, and as I mentioned, they moved here because of the altitude and the geothermal. Their main office is in Canby, Oregon, which is on a, down in the Willamette area. And this is the uh, same picture you had. And this is them um, just going in and pulling some of the weeds. This is some of their workers. This is what it looks like when it's um, fully open. And this is, you know, they have some really good growth.